So, I, like Steve, have a lot more to tell you than I have time for. <clears throat> I cannot talk as fast as him, so I will, uh, I will have to ask you for indulgences, okay? I'm willing to pay. I'm, I'm willing to pay gold, uh, the highest dollar, if you'll just grant me a few extra moments toward the end of the service to be able to say something significant about uh, the, the uh, Reformation. If you would take your hymnals, not your Bibles, take your hymnals and turn in them to number 656. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Martin Luther's hymn. He wrote 37 hymns. This is the one that has risen to the top as his greatest, one that is most known. In fact, it is sung by people of many different denominations. It is a mighty fortress is our God. I want to talk to you about the meaning of this hymn, and then I'm going to try to help you with some application to our particular lives. A mighty fortress is our God. Follow me as I read. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. What we see here in the first verse is a declaration of the fact that God is a mighty fortress. He is a protector of his people. He's also a protector of other people outside the Christian community. And he uses the church to be that, to be the arms and the hands of the Lord Jesus. As Jesus healed and cast out demons, raised the dead, and many things like that, we as his representatives are God's instruments to be used to help others in the same way, in protecting others. He is a bulwark. How many of you actually know what a bulwark is? Okay, so now it's my job to tell you. A bulwark is a wall. That's what it is. It's a wall. It's a protective wall that's often seen in around castles and places like that. A bulwark is the main defense of a castle. In our days, we don't have them because we have planes that drop bombs, and we don't need walls. They are ineffective. But in those days, when he was writing, this was your main defense. So God is like a wall. He is a protective work in our lives. Our helper, he, that is, God is our helper. Now, here we have poetic things going on in this line. Our helper, he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. The word prevailing is really not supposed to be at the end of the sentence in normal, normal English prose, but in, in poetry, and I'm no expert in poetry, but let me just say that oftentimes in poetry, word order is reversed in order for maybe something to rhyme with the line before, and so you need to think it through and put it back in its original order to understand the meaning. So what he is saying is that he is our helper. He is one who prevails. And he prevails amid the flood of mortal ills. So he is the one, even though we are experiencing all kinds of, of terrible catastrophes, even in our day of, 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 uh, of storms, of hurricanes, of fires, of even personal fires that we talked about this morning in the Seleski home. Those are the kinds of things that God is involved in and helping. Now, he does not tell us that he prevents those things from happening, but he indeed enables us to profit from them. Oftentimes, he does protect us from them, but not in every case. In the Christian's walk with God, our difficult circumstances are all ordered by him 
sovereignly for our good in order to train us and to help us to grow and develop as believers. So he is the one that help us, helps us amid them. He also uses us to help others amidst their kinds of uh, mortal ills that uh, come into their lives. He, he points out that the cause of these things oft times is Satan himself. It is always evil in some form or another, whether it be a Satan's henchmen or people who are um, following their old sinful nature as well. For since our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, well, he is saying that Satan is the cause of many kinds of catastrophes. His craft, he's crafty and his power he is great. He is very smart and he's very powerful. And he's also armed with cruel hate. And so he does not just do one thing or two things. He is continually harassing the people who are created in God's image. He hates God's image. And so we see him stirring up strife and catastrophes all over the world. And on earth is not as equal. In other words, he's more powerful than you and me. There's no one in this room that can handle him or deal with him directly on our own. Did we in our own strength confide, he says, if we were, if we were to try to do it on our own, if we were to try to overcome him in our own strength, we, he says, our striving would be losing. We would lose. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Why would we be in desperate straits? Because well, do you ask who that is? Why, it's Christ Jesus. It is he, Lord Sabaoth. Another question, does anybody know what Sabaoth means? All right, you sung this song so many times, and nobody has ever come to me and said, what does Lord Sabaoth mean? As I'm chiding you, okay? So when you come across these things and you don't know what they mean, please tell me so that we can talk about it. Sabaoth means Lord of hosts. He is the Lord Almighty. He is the one who is the Lord of armies. And presently talking about the heavenly armies. He's talking about Jesus Christ as the Lord of armies. So, why that particular name? There are many names given to Jesus as the shepherd, as the savior, as the great physician, and things like that. Why Lord Sabaoth here? Because he's talking about spiritual warfare. He's talking about a great need for us to have protection against this enemy, Satan himself. The greatest thing that Satan can do in a person's life is to cloud their understanding, to keep them from understanding and believing the gospel so that they might eventually go and live in hell away from God forever. That is the greatest thing that he can do, and we cannot resist that. But there is one who is on our side. He is the Lord of hosts. He is Jesus Christ himself. Who You ask the, what that may be, Jesus Christ. It is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name. Uh, from age to age, the same. And he must win the battle. It's not that God said, you must do this, but it is he must because there is no resistance that can be successful against him. And when he draws people to himself, he will indeed save them. And Satan cannot cause them to fall away utterly. Certainly he can harass them. He can cause them to backslide. He can cause them to sin in many different ways. But he cannot cause them to fall away altogether and be lost. And so great news. We are not alone in this. We have God who protects us and the champion, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one who brings about that, that um, rescue for us by dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Now, he continues on by saying, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, do us we will not fear. For God hath willed truth, his truth, to triumph through us. 
there is going to be a lot of pushback in terms of living for the Lord. And so he tells us that the world is filled with devils. If you don't believe that there is a demonic influence in this world, just look at all the evil that we see throughout all nations in many con forms or our kinds. And so he says this world is, devil thrill is filled with devils and it will threaten to undo us. We're going to find ourselves being uh, tempted from many quarters. We're going to be finding ourselves threatened by those who will not believe and hate what God has to stand for. We will find ourselves tired and weak and wanting to give up and to become depressed and things like that. There are many kinds of influences that will be played upon us by Satan himself, but not personally, but through his uh, cohorts, the demons, and by our own sinful nature as well. And so he says, we will not fear. Why? Why is it that we won't fear? Because God has given us something through Christ that will help us. God has willed his truth, his truth to triumph through us. This is one thing among the many things that Martin Luther was so concerned about, that the truth would be in the hands of the people that it would not be hidden from them by a foreign language that was spoken in the worship services that they could not understand. And so he had the Bible translated into the vernacular of his particular country so that people could know the truth themselves and then have the wherewithal to resist Satan in their lives. The prince of darkness, Grimm, speaking of Satan again, we don't tremble for him. His race we can endure for lo his doom is sure one little word shall fell him so we look at Satan then in a different way first of all we realize that in the first verse we said that if we were to, to, to depend upon our own strength we would be losers but we're not depending upon our own strength we have a champion first of all that has dealt with our sins our guilt so that Satan does not have that weapon against us to continually bring against us accusation after accusation accusation after accusation, which indeed are true in the sense that we did do those things and we are guilty of them, but our guilt has been removed by Jesus Christ himself through his substitutionary death on our behalf. Satan then cannot bring that guilt to have any effect upon us because we know the truth and the truth is we have been forgiven. We have been declared not guilty because the guilt was placed upon Jesus. And so when he comes to us, if we know the truth, if we know that we're forgiven, if we know those things have been dealt with, we can then, when we feel that guilt, we can say, you know what? I don't need to bear this any longer because Jesus bore it on the cross. And so I will not tremble because of Satan's ability to point out my weaknesses or to point out my failures in the past because those have been taken care of. And now I am adopted into God's family, one who is forgiven and loved and drawn as one who is wanted. So the prince of darkness, Grim, we do not tremble for him. His rage we can endure, and he does indeed rage throughout the world against the Christian church. There are more people that die as a result of their Christian faith today than over all of the centuries that have been since the church began. So his rage is, is very evident all over. The, we don't hear it a lot. It's not reported a lot, but it is happening. We can endure this. Well, you mean we can endure being martyred? We can endure being dismembered? We can endure being burned as was Huss? Yes. Why? Because we know that Satan will lose. It's not, it's not a thing that is is normally what we feel today. We're more today in our, in our culture about ourselves, our own personal comfort and our personal desires and what, what we want when we want it. 
Luther is trying to raise our awareness and our allegiance to the kingdom of Christ. And we are here as his soldiers to bring success to his kingdom. It is not about us and our personal comfort. It's about us promoting the kingdom so that others might be included. Comfort comes. It comes later. But now we suffer. And that is the natural thing Jesus told us told us if we would live for him that we would indeed suffer that's why he told us to take up our crosses and men and women have done this over the ages for years and years because it jesus is worth it the people around us are worth it we will suffer for them and then will come our time in which we'll be rewarded. So he says, his rage we can endure for his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. He's speaking about the word of truth. The word of truth that Jesus used himself in the wilderness when Satan tempted him and attacked him there. He used the word of truth from the scriptures. And the better we understand those scriptures, the better we are able to use them in our own defense. One little word will fell him. He cannot resist the word of God itself. That word, above all earthly powers... No thanks to them abideth. Okay, here's that word order thing again. Okay, and what it's saying is that word abides. That word is now continuing. That is, that word is current in our lives as well. This word continues now. No thanks to the earthly powers. Now, Steve was telling us this morning about how God providentially used the earthly powers to promote the Reformation and, and, the, and the, uh, the inventions that came at this particular time of Luther's life. However, the word, the, the church continues because the word of the God itself is powerful. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. That word still abides. It still saves people who are condemned. So that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abide. It, it abides with, uh, this word abides. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us with us sideth. This is the source of our strength. These are the weapons that we use to fight against the world of darkness. It is the love, the love that we have for one another. It is the spiritual gifts that we use to minister to one another. It is the spiritual gifts of sharing our faith with other people. Those are the things that he has given us to keep us safe and help us to survive. But goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. Now, Martin Luther isn't against having a house. He isn't having, against having clothes to put on our backs or the food to eat. What he is telling us is that even these things which are essential to life are not anywhere near as important as your spiritual life. We have this confused today. Many of these things have become our lives. Our entertainment has become our lives. Our possessions have become our lives. Now, when I arrived at the scene of the fire on Tuesday night at the Seleski home, there was a family on the sidewalk there who kept saying that God has preserved us. We have lost our things but we have our lives, and God has been with us. You see, there are things that are more important than our material possessions. He says, let them go. He's not telling us to live a life without them, but not hold on to them. If somebody says, either your life or your faith, let your life go. It's either your possessions or your faith. Let your possessions go, he said, because those things are not eternal. They're temporary. The thing that is eternal is your heart, your soul, that will, end, will eventually end up in heaven. So he tells us 
The body they may kill, but God's truth abides still. Satan cannot fight against the truth. He cannot destroy it. He cannot get rid of it. Hang on to it. Live for it. Let it be the source of your life, his truth in Jesus Christ. His kingdom is forever. Martin Luther was writing this hymn as a response to Psalm 46, and I would encourage you to read that, because God is indeed protecting in the midst of the uh, masses of all kinds of trouble that we have in our lives. But the most important thing that he holds on to in us, the most important thing that he will never let go of and that he will preserve until the day he brings us home is our spiritual condition before him, our being justified by faith, our spiritual life. We are to value that above everything else. Let goods and kindred go. They're temporary. It is the soul that is important. That is what we are to live for. God will preserve that through his champion, the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot do that on our own. God does it for us. So I think it would be appropriate for us now to close with singing this hymn now that we understand it a little better. All right. Last, would you come and lead us in that hymn?